Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited for the conversation today with Jason Wilk, who is the CEO at Dave, a challenger bank which has been one of the leaders in the U.S. in fintech around neobanking and consumer positioning. And I'm really excited to have this conversation and learn from Jason. So with that, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Lex. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. My pleasure. Let's start at the beginning, which is your professional journey. You know, we're going to spend a bit of time talking about Dave, talking about its offerings, the market journey and everything involved in that. But I'd love to understand a little bit more about your foundational entrepreneurial experiences and what it is that was important to you when you got started. Well, I wanted to be an entrepreneur since I was a very early age. You know, I really envied my my father who was I was born in a middle-class family. He was a independent insurance broker, never really made much money, but he always got to set his own schedule, got to work from from home, played a lot of golf and tennis. And I thought that seemed like a pretty good opportunity to become your own boss. So that was always kind of in the back of my mind to have that freedom and flexibility. Albeit, I was much more interested in in sort of products. From an early on age, I was really trying to come up with different ideas. Like I had an idea for a acne fighting shaving cream. And I think I called Neutrogena when I was like 10 or 11 year, years old. I had an idea for a golf bag that had a built in umbrella. I was a big golfer and it was always so heavy and a pain to carry around this umbrella. So I always knew I wanted to develop things. And it wasn't until I got to my senior year, well, junior, senior year of college, where I got to really dive into the internet. And I built a company called One Day Sports, which I thought would be really an interesting company given, I mean, I loved golf stuff and I really loved this website called woot.com early on, which was one of the, the very first or I think the very first flash sales site where they would sell a consumer electronic at the lowest price in the country, have a fixed amount of those items and they would sell it for 24 hours or until the item was sold out. And I thought the same thing would, would, would be pretty applicable to the golf industry where there's always new stuff coming out. The new stuff's always really expensive, but all of the things from last year are still a really good product. And I was the kind of guy that would buy that stuff. And so I figured a Woot.com model of doing a flash sale site to liquidate one item per day would be just great. And so I, I built that from my dorm room, launched it, did a bunch of viral marketing, sad to age myself, but on MySpace to try and drive user adoption. But it worked and we got to over 100,000 users and sold a lot of product. And I was able to sell that business when I graduated school. So I came out of college effectively, no debt, had a little bit of money in my pocket to go do some traveling and, and be a little patient on what I wanted to do next. So you had this entrepreneurial DNA kind of built into you from a very early age. You mentioned product. And I wonder, even at that time, were you thinking about product as a software product as something you build like a machine that repeats and grows or were you thinking more of like I want to build a business and so I'm going to think about sales and marketing and trying to create like economics that work what intuitions did you bring into that experience or maybe what intuitions did you take out of it I was too young to really know about developing internet businesses and it was still a very nascent industry so my head my head was still focused on sort of you know physical consumer product as I got into college, I really became obsessed with reading TechCrunch when that first launch and every article that came out, I was all over it, even dabbled in my own tech blog as well to write about my favorite companies and, and learn about all the interesting things that different entrepreneurs were doing. So it was really once I saw the power of the internet and how you could ship software, that just became really exciting for me. And I was trying to figure out what, what would be my niche in that. And One Day Sports was the first opportunity I, I had there. So what came next, I 
was figuring out what I wanted to do next. I was doing a little bit of sort of consulting or advising for some companies that I liked. And there was a, a particular business that I really got along very well with, with the co-founder. Part of my travels, when I got out of school, I went all over Asia, spent a decent amount of time in Nepal, and really connected with this Nepalese co-founder of this other company. He hadn't been back to see his family in in many, many years. And we really bonded over that and ultimately you know, started getting to know him more. And we had just started learning about this new program called Y Combinator, which I had been covering on my tech blog. And I'd met a few early entrepreneurs like Drew Houston at Dropbox. And people really seemed to be talking up this, this program. My co-founder that, you know, that I was talking to, Paris, he was a big fan of Paul Graham from his novels, you know, Hackers and Painters. And he, he had built up a pretty big resume for himself already. So Paris was already a fan from the from the coding industry. And I said, look, I've got this new idea. You know, I'm not sure if it's going to be the one that retires us, but ultimately I think Y Combinator would, would be interested in it. I said, your startup seems, seems to be going okay, but, you know, if we got into this exclusive program, you know, would you consider jumping ship and coming with me? And we got an interview with, with Paul Graham and, and Jessica and we flew up there and we pitched this idea, which at the time was called 140 bets. And if anyone's familiar with like stock twits, where people can kind of talk about their favorite stock stock picks, we want to do the same thing, but but for sports betting. And we really wanted to own sort of the Twitter space for people talking and publishing about their bets. And we could keep track of people's wins and losses and you could monetize your following. That was the, the high level idea. Y Combinator liked it. We got in. Paris left his job and we moved to San Francisco for six months to go do that program and attracted some investors like Mark Cuban and the Kraft family who were obviously deeply tied to the sports industry and thought that we were, you know, two young, smart guys, but didn't have much of a track record. And so we had raised this very small seed round from them. That really was a, you know, a pretty eye-opening experience. It was our, my first time raising outside money and wanted to be a, a good steward of, of their capital. And they also kind of forced it upon us as well by capping our salaries at $30,000 a year until we could get the company to be profitable, regardless if we were to raise another round of funding. And so I think that taught us a lot early on, one about you know needing to preserve capital, not hiring too many people until you have product market fit. And Paris and I largely worked just for, it's basically just the two of us for a couple of years while we built this software system out. He basically built the entire thing himself. And we couldn't really get that product market fit. But fortunately, we, we still had almost all the money still left in the bank because we were so so frugal about spending it and our salaries were so low. And through a series of sort of pivots and talking to customers and talking to potential people and trying to make it a potential B2B angle, we ended up figuring out this niche in the media industry that is a random pivot, but ultimately that a lot of our potential media customers were having trouble getting enough video views on their web videos to fulfill all their advertising deals. And we had built this software on the back end that kind of worked over the top of existing video technology. It was one of our series of pivots where instead of sort of broadcasting your sports picks on, on the web, we'd have an overlay on video content. So if you're watching ESPN Plus or if you're watching some other sports live streaming, we had an overlay that basically let you sort of make a real-time pick of who's going to make this free throw, who's going to make the next touchdown. It was almost like this real-time kind of betting angle. Well, we were way too early on in that in that industry, as obviously all this real-time sports betting has really picked up now, but you know, this is many, many years ago. But what we learned through that is that companies like ESPN and others were having, again, a lot of trouble figuring out how to get enough eyeballs to fulfill their ad deals. So we ended up building one of the first sort of video syndication networks online. And so we would go find 100 sports sites that were interested in picking up ESPN's video content, as an example. ESPN could upload their content to our portal. The small websites could put, put it on their site, all sorts of you know, amazing sports clips. And ESPN would rev share with those smaller websites on any incremental video views they could drive. We built that, that business up to north of 20 million of revenue in a short amount of time. We were 
number 25 on the Inc. on the Inc. fastest growing companies in America list, and then ultimately sold it in 2015. So that was an absolutely fascinating background. And I think that needing to pivot is definitely something that you learn as an entrepreneur, especially with a bit of financial pressure hanging over your head. I'd love to transition to Dave and the story around that, because so far the businesses you've described have, you know, they've been either kind of focused on media and internet and accruing attention. How did you have the idea for Dave and kind of what was your motivation? The idea for Dave, which I think the best ideas always stem from, is something you have a lot of personal pain with. I think what we didn't love about the the previous company was that while it was a good business, my co-founder and I, like we didn't really have any passion about it whatsoever. And it was growing and we had an offer to sell and it made the most sense to, to do that. Dave was something that I had a lot of personal pain, which is overdrafting going through college, certainly overdrafting while we were building our, our business with such a limited salary that we had from our first set of investors. And just the agony of a $34 overdraft fee when you're just going negative by 5 or $10 to buy gas or groceries or whatever you need was starting to rack up in the, into the tune of a couple hundred bucks a year, if, if, not, if not more. And recognize that if I had this pain, I can only imagine what the rest of America was sort of going through. If you just look at the number of, of people in this country who are living paycheck to paycheck, it's, it's the overwhelming majority. And my co-founder and I, we knew that for our next venture, we wanted to go for something that was big. So many of these industries that are, that are large, such as you know healthcare and telecommunications, all seem you know, like very big things to disrupt. But banking seemed like it was ripe for disruption. We had seen a, a, a very early entrant in FinTech called Acorns, which you probably are familiar with. And they were leveraging this new company called Plat, which was giving people access to checking account data. And I thought, you know, wow, I mean, if, if my bank only used any of the data it had on hand about my transactions, my payment history, they should know that I have money coming in at some point. They should know about my upcoming bills. And there's no need to charge a $34 overdraft fee on something that is such a short-term amount of money that is highly likely that I'm going to be able to pay back. And so that was the idea that you know, it would be very tough for us to go launch a, a straight-up bank of our own. But if we were to take a different angle to sort of be a better overdraft solution for every bank in the country, that that would be a great way to get a lot of people to start using the app and eventually launch our own banking service later on once we've sort of figured out the, the industry. We also recognized that we needed to have a brand name that was very friendly and approachable. And so the name Dave came to mind to not only represent sort of Dave versus Goliath, but also just to be this everyday person's name that people recognize, it's easy to spell, and feels like something that is not going to rob you of a bunch of overdraft fees. So... Dave was born as effectively a way for customers to come in, link their existing bank account, which would give us access to their past several months of, of data, which lets me know how often are they getting paid, when do they get paid, what kind of inflows and outflows do they have, and we can make an instant decision to offer that customer up to, at the time, $75 of interest-free overdraft protection. And that 75 bucks would be sent right back to their Chase or Wells Fargo account to cover things like gas and groceries. In that way, the customer could avoid having to go negative on their account and avoid the fees altogether from their bank. And if they happen to take their account negative and were at risk of an overdraft, almost all banks at that point would give you to the end of the day to put money back in your account before they charge you the fee. And so a lot of our customers are using the Dave overdraft solution to put money in to bring, bring their balance back to normal so they could also avoid the fee. This service has been used about 60 million times now, and our customers have, have avoided billions of dollars in overdraft fees as a result. So that was the, the, you know, the early founding story as a sort of a differentiated way to build a, a, you know, a banking competitor. Were you thinking of this as a banking competitor? Were you thinking of this as a lending competitor? Is there a difference 
in your mind? And I ask because you know different companies kind of congeal into this neo banking offering. Sometimes out of payments and trying to move money around. Sometimes out of lending, you know, and providing credit. And sometimes out of just trying to get people's deposits, you know, to sit in some place and earn interest. How did you think about it? What was your destination when you were like, we're going to try and get rid of this friction point? We looked at it as, as overdraft. It was never supposed to be a lending competitor. We never looked at any peers in consumer lending. This is always that banks are extending very small amounts of credit for overdraft, and it's incredibly expensive and painful for consumers. And so we wanted to compete with that specific angle of, of banking first. And once we amassed enough customers, we could then launch our own checking account and start to take those customers away. What does it mean to be a customer at that stage? And maybe walk us through how you went from you know, that beginning overdraft replacement, getting somebody to say, oh yeah, well, this will make my life better. And then how does that convert into a decision to use something as your primary account? We early on, we marketed as a sort of personal financial management solution. You know, stop overdrafting at your bank, use Dave instead, get access to a quick amount of money at no interest and go get the gas and groceries you need without having to go into, into debt with your, with your bank. We paired that with sort of financial insights too. So we would let you know about an upcoming bill that was potentially putting your balance below your threshold. So customers could set like a, a low balance threshold at Chase to say, you know, if my balance goes below 20 bucks or is predicted to go lower than 20 bucks, send me a notification. And so Dave was getting really good at, at these financial predictions. And so we could tell you a week ahead of time, like, hey, Lex, your Netflix bill is due on Thursday, your car payment's due on Friday. And as such, your balance is at risk of going you know, below zero. So that tool paired with spotting customers the money at that time was really the the early innovation and what was the primary product use case for the first couple of years. As far as you know, when we wanted to make the transition, so how we did it was we launched a wait list for our customers to test how many people of our existing, I can't remember how many users we had at that point, but how many of our customers were interested in joining Dave Banking if we were to launch our own feature. So Dave Banking wait list went live and it was something like 50% of our customers were joining the waitlist. And so we knew we were onto something. We knew that launching our own banking service was the future of the business. It was in the original seed deck from, from the very beginning of the company. And so with all the sort of banking as a service tools coming out, we thought it was the right time to, to do that. Dave was a very early, one of the earliest customers of Plaid. And then we would be one of the earliest customers of our banking as a service vendor as well. And so we launched Dave Banking in 2020 after a couple of years of, of building out the, the infrastructure. One question for you on the budgeting and the financial planning piece. How was that built out? Was it a rules-based engine that sat on top of Plaid or was it you know, machine learning? Kind of what did you set up to be able to do these predictive analytics? It's now machine learning based, but before it was it was largely just rules-based. You know, we would be able to look and see if, if there's any recurrence in a particular bill and let you know about that upcoming schedule. And it always bothered me in my own checking account when I was growing up with my Chase account. I've been banking with them for 15 years and they obviously see a lot of recurrence in my payment activity, but why not make at least some educated guesses as to how much upcoming liabilities I actually have in my account? Because that was one of the biggest reasons I overdrafted a lot was I had $100 in my account, but I had all these liabilities due before my next paycheck. And as such, my current true like spending power is actually negative if I went and kept going as I was, was going. I didn't really actually have $100 in my account as my bank was telling me. And so that's why we built that feature to solve for the pain of, of just not knowing where you stand. Yeah, it's unbelievable how little the banks did with your data despite having all of it. You know, and I think the writing was on the wall with mint.com, but it took a number of years for for fintechs to chip away at it and create sufficient infrastructure for banking itself as a service and then create the places to which consumers are drawn, right? Pulled out of their kind of traditional banking experience. And so what you're describing makes perfect sense. I mean, nobody wants to budget. Nobody actually wants to do the work of putting things into a spreadsheet and counting transactions, we have robots for that. So what you describe makes you know perfect sense to me and the robots get better and better. Can you talk a little bit about 
thinking through the economics of the business and then maybe you know what additional products did you launch once you started kind of getting people to think of Dave as as their home in addition to the feature that you've described yeah so from a pricing perspective the way we monetized early on was through a $1 per month subscription the reason we came up with that was that we wanted to build a product that was compelling enough to make a dollar a month and make that a commitment from our customer that they wanted to actually improve their financial their financial health The second piece of it was we knew we didn't want to charge any interest. We didn't want to charge any any mandatory fees. And so we built the the sort of advanced business in a very unique way. And we were really the first guys out there to launch this, this dual pricing model where a customer could get access to our overdraft funds via ACH, which takes a couple of days on the banking rails for free. So you always have the ability to transfer money from Dave to an external account for free, no interest, no no credit check, no late fees. But we also let people send the money instantly to a debit card. We had partnered with MasterCard and Visa on that, and we let our members choose to pay a small expedited processing fee similar to Cash App or Venmo to get the money they want instantly. On top of that, we felt that a... And a unique play on monetizing would be to do it through tips. Now, we had seen the rise of, of tip revenue really do wonders for GoFundMe, which was better than a mandatory pricing model. There's a lot of companies in Asia and gaming companies and Twitch that were starting to do well monetizing tips. And so we thought, why not do this for consumer banking, where we're helping somebody with a service, we're saving them $34 on an overdraft fee. So that must be worth something to them. Something to them. And if they can afford to pay us something, great and if they can't they don't have to and so we we built the tip the tip side of the business and also partnered with feeding america where we'll actually pledge a meal to feeding america for each percent you do tip and the combination of that has worked well we have about 50 percent of our customers at least tip once and it's been a very effective model yeah i think the impact of the company really you know, can't be understated. You've got something like over six million people that are members of the network, and then a million and a half monthly transacting members. And you know, the revenue is kind of floating around forty million a quarter. So this has grown to be a pretty powerful business, serving a demographic which, which is tough to serve. It's tough to generate economics unless you are kind of helping a lot of people at the same time. One thing I wanted to ask is once you got the business to the size and the shape, you made a decision or Dave made the decision to follow the SPAC route. And we covered SPACs quite a bit on the podcast and in the newsletter as they became a popular vehicle to go from private to public last year and the year before that. What was your sort of set of thinking like as you interacted with that process? Can you just tell us a little bit more about how that felt and what was required? We're already working with our SPAC sponsor, Victory Park, in another capacity. They were our lending facility to service all of the existing advances that we had outstanding. So they would already given us $100 million of commitments that we were using to fund the overdraft advances. And we already had a good relationship with them. They were a board observer of the business, so they were very close to the company. And their founders at Victory Park had a lot of experience in the SPAC market prior to the most more recent wave of of popularity. So when it came to interviewing a bunch of different parties there, we were were effectively weighing if we wanted to do a private round or go the SPAC route. A traditional IPO would have probably taken us a little bit too too long, and we weren't quite ready for from that perspective. And so, weighed the sort of guaranteed capital and the price and dilution. It made the most sense for us to go this back route at that time. And we had already been preparing the last twelve plus months with building out our management team to be public company ready. And so, it seemed like the right opportunity for the business, and the market certainly was rewarding. SPACs at that time. So that was how we made our decision. Gotcha. Was there a lot of work that you had to do to achieve that public company readiness? Like when you look at, you know, having, you've done White Combinator, you've gone through kind of the very early stage journey, and that requires really knowing the venture capital ecosystem. And now you're public and you're familiar with the 
with the public markets. How do you think about the public markets now? Like, what is that experience like for an operator? If an entrepreneur is thinking about, should I take a venture check? Should I take a SPAC check? Like, what's the evaluation criteria? It's very different now from that perspective, being a public company versus a private company. You know, you spend the last decade building relationships with venture capitalists, and it just turns out those guys can really help you get your company to an IPO. But once you do go public, you have to now start to know a whole new set of investors as it's I mean, aside from the, the evergreen or crossover venture funds that are al- allowed to hold public, uh, public equity. Most of the early stage and, and middle stage kind of investors are, are not, not even allowed to hold pri- public equity. So you end up somewhat on the other side of the table with, with these guys. And it's really interesting because you have to go out and build brand new relationships to, to build your cap table and, have new longer term investors that are, are willing to believe in you. And that's been a learning curve and an education process and a lot of networking and traveling to, to try and do that. Do you have any sympathy for publicly traded banks now that you're public in terms of the operating environment that they're in and, and some of the restrictions around being nimble and so on that they face? Yeah, I, I think it, there is definitely a, a challenge there. You know, when you're raising money as a private company, you have to convince effectively one, maybe two investors of the long-term prospect of your business. They take a board seat, they're there to help you, and there's no day-to-day fluctuations of your of your price until you actually go out and do the next round. Whereas now you're dealing with hundreds or you know, thousands of investors on a daily basis who are, who are trying to peg a value on your stock. There's short sellers out there you have to think about. There's just a lot more nuances to being a, a, a public company than a, than a private company from that perspective. Operating the business is is effectively the same. I mean, we keep our heads down. We we now think you know a lot more diligently about how to plan for our quarters and make sure we you know have a plan that's you know, achievable yet optimistic and keep people motivated. It's really just all the technical nature that you have to kind of deal with and the new shareholder base that is more like the difference I think at this point versus operating the the company. If you look at the results of the company, they've been steady and growing while the markets more broadly in tech and on the macroeconomic side have been volatile and unpredictable. And so having exposure to that, I'm sure it can be quite distracting. One thing I wanted to ask is around industry structure. And I think that it's an increasingly competitive space and we're likely to see consolidation in the industry. I think we're likely to see consolidation of features as well as attempts to kind of deepen unit economics for various players and try to offer lots of different stuff. So, you know, whether it's the Chimes of the World or SoFi or, you know, Robinhood or Coinbase, often once you get to scale, you're kind of looking at the same customers and there's a set of apps on their phone that those customers have for kind of different banking features. But then the industry follows these trends of having a lot of applications or point solutions for particular features and then shifting back to kind of a unified platform of all the stuff, like a big Wells Fargo or City, and then unbundling it again into next generation applications and point solutions and kind of going back and forth in a dialectic. What's your kind of strategic view on that? How are you thinking about that relative to partners, relative to operating strategy? How do you think about the context? Well, I think there's been this big shift towards people wanting to be super apps, which I tend to, to disagree with. And I don't think we've seen many of those succeed, especially in the US. I think there's been some, some success in, in places like Asia. But ultimately, I think when it comes to banking, I think people want to bank at some place where it is known as the focal point of the business. When banking becomes a sort of side aspect is what we've seen with a lot of fintechs who are trying to cross-attach a checking account to what they already offer. We're not seeing a lot of success from, from, from those stories play out. And so where I think Dave really wins is that our overdraft offering, which is best in class, it, you can get up to 500 bucks, you can build credit. There's still no interest and no no late fees. That is a perfect solution combined with banking, as you can now spend your overdraft with us instantly on your Dave debit card. And so I think the cross attach and sort of bundling of our two features made a lot more sense because it's very synergistic versus some other apps I can think of where 
banking is very much seemed like a bolt on and, and unsurprisingly, they're not really getting much traction with it. So your thought is continuing to sharpen the focus on the core audience and kind of going deeper with them? Yeah, I think being a best in class, no hidden fee checking account that has industry best overdraft that customers can rely on and doesn't put them into any kind of debt cycle with fees, I think that is a really winning strategy. And we'll certainly have features we layer on to you know, boost retention and keep people more engaged with the product. But ultimately, we think we have a very, like, the strongest offering of the neobanks in the country at, at this point, and the markets will eventually follow. The markets will eventually follow. Great wisdom. Jason, thank you so much for joining us today and for telling the Dave story. If our audience wants to learn more about either the company or you, where should they go? Dave.com. <laughs> Easy enough. Fantastic. Great to have you on. Thanks, Lex. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.